Blurton on that spot. So that, that place is loaded with history. Now, Edmund Rice wanted to extend his school, so he wanted that piece of land. And he bid for it, and he bid against the bishop, who was an autocratic villain by the name of Hussey. Hussey was so important to the British that they gave him a military guard of honour when he was being consecrated above in Dublin. Never ha- During the penal days, shouldn't have happened, but they did it. That'll tell you how fond they were a hussy. So Rice uh, outbid him and built his school there. Now here's the rub. Rice was illegal and was illegal for many, many years. It was illegal until the, new, until the native government was set up. They never got a penny from the state. They were illegal because under the Act of Union of 1800, no new religious order could be founded. Rice started 1802, so he was outside the pale the whole time. He did his own thing. He did his own form of education. There is no, there is no rebel that I know of like him. He was a bloodless rebel, unlike me. But he was, he was a, a wonderful, wonderful man. He was the first ever to introduce free education since the Reformation. Prior to that, we had the monasteries here in Ireland who, who, who taught people free of gratis. But he came along after the Refor- well after the Reformation when it wasn't the in, the, in th- the in thing to do and he taught people free and gratis. As well as that, uh, he also clothed any boys who were could, whose parents could not afford them. That was the majority. He clothed them for Holy Communion and Confirmation. Now, I should put that in reverse because at that time you were confirmed before you received Holy Communion, which I thought was the more intelligent thing to do. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he also arranged that every by attendant school would have a, f- a reasonably full stomach because to quote race, an empty stomach is an empty brain. And he maintained if your stomach was empty, your brain couldn't function because it was concentrating on the stomach. So you got a half loaf of bread and a cup of milk, a mug of milk, every morning if you, if you, if you didn't have a breakfast. And that went on for, for, for well over a century in Mount Sain. So he was spending all his own money. He built his own schools, lock, stock and barrel. The parish didn't build anything for him. They, they owned, the Christian brothers owned their own schools. They're built out of, out of their own resources. It's the most, to me, it's the most wonderful order that Ireland ever produced. I know they get a bad press. They don't deserve it. Now, I diverge for a minute away from Barrick City. It's an extraordinary thing that Three religious orders are founded by three Waterford citizens. There is no other country in the world can claim that, no other town or village. You had Edmund Rice, as I said, with the Christian brothers and, of course, the Presentation brothers. You had um, uh, Margaret Elbert from Thomas Street, who found the Sisters of the Holy Faith. She did six months in jail for, for seditious libel against her Britannic Majesty. In, 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 she was imprisoned in Dublin. And you had a more recently... Um, brother Matthias Barrett from Lower Yellow Road who died only a few years ago he founded the Brothers of the Good Shepherd and they operate in New Mexico, southern states of America and Canada, they look after dropouts and drug addicts recovering drug addicts and alcoholics so there's three people from Waterford founded three religious orders in the Catholic Church amazing get back to Rice and to Barrick Street, uh, that I think is the most um, the most best known address in Waterford because people from Newfoundland, New, New Zealand, Australia, you name it, wherever the brothers are, they come here, they know about Mount Sain, they know it's situated in Barrick Street. So it's a very, very important place. Now across the road, as I said, the, our, the uh, infantry barracks was built. And as a result of that, we have three straight roads, the only three straight roads in, in the old city. And they are um, military road, self-explanatory. There's Morrison's Road, which is known as Artillery Road. That's his own name. And Lorial Road was Infantry Road. So the Infantry Road took you to the Infantry Barracks. And the Military Road took you up to the Artillery Road, which connected with the Artillery Barracks at the top of Barrack Street, which was built in, in 1816. 18, uh, 16, between 16 and 19. It took three years to build it because it was a very um, awkward place to build. No, um, the barracks. The barracks is we've we've put our um, we've turned our swords into plowshares because the barracks is now occupied by uh, army citizens of Waterford. It is no longer a military barracks, and I'm glad to see it. 
The archway is being preserved, I'm glad to know that, because that's a beautiful archway leading into the barracks. The, the buildings are going to be used to accommodate the overflow that we have at the moment in the city, the overflow of population. Up then to the, uh, the top of Manor Hill. Now the Irish have a habit of, they don't know whether you, you don't know whether you're being insulted or uh, complimented by them. We're, we're very subtle at this. So that's known as Bunker's Hill. And Bunker Hill was the first battle in the War of American Independence. The Americans lost it, but the British suffered very heavy losses. So when the story of that came, came about, the story of that was, was um, put around uh, the city. They decided to call that Bunker Hill. And the British at the present time don't know that they're being complimented or, or insulted. You can make up your own mind about it. Uh, farther up then, uh, there was a line of public houses. That's all I remember here uh, in Barrick Street. At this, uh, and it was also inhabited by an awful lot of uh, sergeants and instructor sergeants in the militia, which was based in the barracks, uh, the infantry barracks. There was a social club then for the, for the soldiers in both barracks. Roughly, it's difficult to know exactly where it was, but I think it was probably um, at the corner of Catherine's Avenue. That's the, the nearest I can find to it. Yeah. Right in front of Catherine's Avenue, then you had a very open space, still there. And uh, <coughs> there the military bands used to entertain the people, particularly on a, on a Sunday afternoon in the summertime, they'd entertain them. That's Barrick Street. And what about um, any memories you have, just yourself growing up, of the barracks? Just what happens around the barracks? Well, the, the barracks, there's an unusual thing about that barracks. Um, the, the entrance in Green Street, now I'm going away from barracks here, but the entrance to that barracks in Green Street, there's a very large uh, green coloured gate. And over that is the inscription, Mount Sign Intermediate School, Bun Skull Canuck Sheen. The secondary school, the Christian brothers had no money to build a secondary school. So shortly after the, shortly after independence was, was proclaimed, 1923, when the barracks was evacuated, there was only a small number of soldiers remaining after 1923. The Department of Defence handed over part of that to the Christian brothers on, on a rental basis. And there the sec that was the secondary school up to the beginning of the war in 1939 when the Department of Defence took back the barracks and the soldiers were housed there. Now there were two, there were two battalions there during the war. There was the 3rd Battalion and the 25th Battalion. The 3rd is a regular battalion from the regular army. The 25th was a volunteer group. And uh, there were the two, two groups housed in, well, there were the two groups that were here in Waterford, based in Waterford. You also had the local defence force training there. And you had the various organisations that sprang up during the war. There was the ERP, that's Air Raid Precautions. The, um, let's see if I can remember these now, the LSF, Local Security Force. They were an auxiliary police force, for want of a better word. There was the LDF, Local Defence Force, and they were armed. They were an armed group. <coughs> they were a second line of defence and uh, under army control, army jurisdiction. Uh, there was the Maritime Inscription, that's now known as the Slew Mirror. The Maritime Inscription consisted mostly of fellows who were interested in sailing and who knew a bit about the, uh, the sea, so they joined this Maritime Inscription. Uh, they, there were a lot of gags used to have about them. When the, these fellows are paraded in uniform, everyone has said that it was the only navy in the world where you went home to your dinner on a bicycle. <laughs> but they, we, had, we had no ships. We had nothing. Uh, every man in the LDF was issued with a Lee Enfield rifle that dated back to the Boer War. Uh, the every rifle is dated as well as numbered. You had a bayonet from the First World War and you had 25 rounds of ammunition full stop. That's 25 bullets. That's all you had. We didn't have any equipment. And neutrality was important that we defend it. Uh, the barracks, that's all I remember. I remember the plane as a kid in the artillery barracks. That was blown up in 1922 during the siege of Waterford, July 1922. 
And what actually happened was there was a the uh, the Free State were attacking from from uh, Mount Misery. And they had two artillery pieces, the same one, but my research shows two. One was high explosive, the other was incendiary shells. And one of the shells landed uh, on the barracks and it was a direct hit on the magazine. And the magazine blew up and the barracks went on fire. And it was burned down, all that was left there was a shell, a very dangerous shell. But we used to play cowboys and Indians that had come from school. So the corporation took it, acquired it, took it over, and built Cassidy's Avenue houses on it. They demolished it and built the houses. I think that was 1938. I'm not too sure of the exact date, but it was before the war. And it was, we lost a, we lost a place for playing. I remember the, the tunnels there at that time, but we didn't go down because of, we were always terrified of rats. That's the reason we didn't go down. Do you know around the corner on, bar, on from the barracks, there's a, there's a plaque up in the wall of someone being shot, what was that? Like? There were two lads shot during the Civil War. Uh, where I live now, and O'Reilly Road in the Cork Road, that's named after one of them. The other was Fitzgerald in the front row of the Cork Road is named after him. No, there was terrible brutality on the part of the Free State. And I should emphasize this, that most of the Free State soldiers were ex-British soldiers. The majority of the IRA took the Republican side, the greater majority. A few became officers in the uh, Free State Army. They were followers of Michael Codden's, you know, Everyone admires Michael Collins, no matter what side you're at. And uh, the, the Free State didn't care who they recruited. They were, they were supported by the banks, supported by the church and the press. Now, there are three things you can't beat. When the three of them are combined together, you've had it. So the Republican movement, and the Republican side rather than the Civil War, was doomed to failure from the word go, once you had those three t- t- uh, attacking you. And when Collins was shot, a Bail in the Blanc in 18, August 1922, a Waterford man, I'm sorry to have to say, took over command of the army. That was General Mulcahy, a past pupil of Mount Sion, a native of Barrick Street. And he took over the, the uh, command of the army. Now Mulcahy was a ruthless, a ruthless villain. And he brought out this uh, rule that if you were found with, with uh, arms on you, you were shot. They were, you were, you were con- brought before a court martial condemned to death and shot. So 77 people were shot for kind arms, including Erkstein Childers. Uh, that was a case, That was a, to me, that was a case of deliberate murder because Childers, was, Childers did not use the gun. Uh, the gun he had was a present given to him by Michael Coddens, and I'm not to believe suitably inscribed. And Childers was found with the gun and he, he was shot by the Free State. But these two lads, they were both from Yoel in County Cork. And they were, they were, they were uh, uh, rounded up in the uh, Knockmill Down Mountains. Uh, found with, naturally, found in possession of uh, weapons, rifle and a revolver, taken down to water barracks, court martialed and shot in Green Street. Shot inside, inside the barracks in, of Green Street. So hence the plaque. That's what that's for. <coughs> there, were, there, were the, there were the two executions in, in Waterford. <coughs> and Waterford would have been very split, wasn't it? Was sp- Waterford was always split. Split from the time of... Um, uh, the time of Parnell, I would think. There was an, a lot followed, followed uh, Parnell. Uh, in, when they followed Parnell, they followed Redmond. Now, uh, on Parnell commemoration, the older fellows just to wear... Um, the, the commemoration of the day of his death, they just wear... Um, an ivy leaf in their coat. And what that meant was, like ivy, I cling to thee. That's, that's the old uh, adage. So Redmond then, uh, he became involved with the volunteers. Now how he was elected into the volunteer movement, I don't know. But the, he slowly but surely took control of the volunteers. And the volunteers were set up to defend Ireland during the common First World War, which everyone knew was going to happen anyway because there were three first cousins after falling out. The three first cousins had a row. The King of England, the, the Tsar of Russia, and the, uh, uh, the Kaiser of Germany. Each of them had a, a common grandmother, uh, uh, Victoria. And when they fell out, there was, there was hell to play, and 40 million people lost their lives. So everyone knew in Ireland they were going to, they were going to be a world war. So the volunteers were set up to defend the country against anybody that might, might attack it. 
you know, the British soldiers go off and do their own thing. But Redmond dedicated the volunteers to the British. He made them a promise that he, the, vol- the volunteers could be used. And that's why a lot went off in the First World War. The, the, Redmond had been promised uh, home rule. And a lot of them went off. Few stayed behind and formed the, Nash, the Irish volunteers, others were called the National Volunteers. Take your pick. But the division was fairly sharp then, after the war, because a lot of them came back and joined the IRA. One of them was an officer here named Paddy Paul, who led the attack in 19, ironically led the attack against the Republicans in 1922 on the city. He was an artillery officer in the British Army in the First World War. Came back and fought with the East Water Brigade right through the Black and Tan War, and then went in with, went in with the Free State. So he was one of the attackers on the city. And uh, the first shell he fired, it landed on his mother's house. His mother was working in the kitchen, nearly killed his mother. That was done in Brewery House in um, Stephen Street, Kylie's Brewery. His, his father was an engineer there. And they occupied that very large house inside in the brewery. It's still there. So to the house dates back to, I think, 1812 or something, around that period. His mother was working in the kitchen. She barely escaped it her life because he blew the roof off of the shelly fert. So the division was very strong. The division was strong in, during the Civil War even uh, because the, um, the Ballybricken pig buyers who were, who were a, strictly a Redmond crowd, they went around canvassing with them uh, and joining people to join the British Army. None of them joined though. They all stayed at home and made money. But they sent off the fools to fight for the empire. And uh, they, they, actually tr- they actually turned on the uh, Republicans occupying the jail when the Free State Army finally crossed the river and hand-to-hand fighting took place in Billy that, that was the end of the Civil War as far as water was concerned. July 1922, the last siege of the city. <coughs> And uh, I'm just trying to think now about other, while well, I have you. Um, yeah, just tell us a bit about science, about being a school there. It was, a, it was a remarkable school to go to because there was no class distinction of any sort, shape or description. Uh, everyone, everyone in Mount Sain was equal. You, uh, there were fellows who went to school with me. I was looking for my father at a job, but not, not had one employment in water in the 30s because of the economic war declared in the country by the British. So there was an economic war on and fixed factories closed down by the new time. So my father had a constant job, so I choose. But majority in my class went to school in bare, barefooted in the summertime and in many cases of the winter. And all any wore, those that were, came from poor backgrounds, all they wore was a jersey and a pants, winter and summer, irrespective of what it was like. And the brothers looked after them very well because uh, at, a, at 11 o'clock, I, the, the cu- I should get tired, there was a customer in Mount Sain that at, on the hour you stood up, blessed yourself, and everyone said, Hail Mary. And you sat down, then again, and re- re- resumed class. Now, as far as I know, that still, that still goes on in Christian Brothers schools. But the 11 o'clock one, the brother would just do that, and the boys who were, didn't have a breakfast that morning would disappear and go to the monastery. Where they got a, a lump of bread, buttered, and a mug of milk. That happened religiously every morning. There were there were a few Jews in, in my class going to school. There was no distinction made at all, and they disappeared, out away from the brother. They disappeared out when when uh, religious instruction was going on. They went out and they were they were taken taken over by an art teacher. It was a, it was a wonderful school to go to. It, it taught you democracy. I thought everyone was equal. One fellow sat next to me, who shall be nameless, uh, for th- for three years. He had a kidney complaint, and he smelled, smelled to the high heaven, especially in the summertime. I met him many years afterwards. A very, very wealthy man. I met him in New York of all places. A very wealthy man, who still remembered with a lot of affection his days in Mount Sinai and the fact that. Uh, he was educated free and gratis, the same as I was, same as we all were that went, went to that school. 
It was a wonderful school. I couldn't say enough about it. That's why I sent my sons there. And, <coughs> I mean, when you say it had bad press... They had a bad press. Why do you think that was? was I think a lot of it came out of Dublin 4. There were, every organisation, irrespective of which one it is, have a few bad apples. There is nobody, there is nobody that's above reproach. We all, we're, we're, all, we're all tainted with a certain amount of evil, irrespective of who or what we are. Now, there was a few fellows slipped into the brothers who, who were not who were paedophiles, let's be honest about it. And uh, they're, they're, they're not alone. But the fact that they were, they were in, in public view, that they, were, they had uh, a public job to do, like in charge of the uh, uh, orphanages and what have you, they stuck out like a sore thumb. And hence the, the press got on it, particularly Dublin 4, and I might say some of the past pupils of the Christian Brothers in RTE, including Gabe Borden, was not very kind to the Christian Brothers. I don't know why. Like me, they got their education free of, free of charge. Well, didn't they have a reputation of being very tough, though, as well? They were tough, but you, you name a school to me, there wasn't tough at that time. There, there was none. My wife, now who comes from a different tradition altogether to me, um, told me about the toughness in the school she went to, which would shall be nameless. Um, I would prefer to get what I often got, four or five slaps on the hand, than to sit down and write 500 lines. I, 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 think, I think that's more demoralising altogether, because you're, doing the, you're writing the same thing, you're repeating the same thing over and over again, so that your brain is addled. You go crazy. And as well as that, you get a cramp at the back of your hand here, which is not very pleasant. And to sit down and do X number of lines, to me, that's, that's worse punishment than getting the slap is gone. You get it. And the pain lasts for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour, but it's gone then. But that other type of punishment is soul destroying, it's, it's brain damaging, I think. Um, you mentioned the Faha Church. Yes. So what happened to that? Where is that? The Faha Church, this portion of it there, it's incorporated into the chapel of Mount Sinai down there, where, where, the, where the, the remains rest. There's a corner. Whenever, let me, let me explain this to you. Whenever a church is demolished, a corner remains, which marks uh, ecclesiastical property. Well, that's an old, old uh, rule. So the corner of a church remained, and uh, that's incorporated in, into the existing church. There's also a portion of it incorporated into what was the bakery. You know there's a bakery attached to that church. Edmund Rice employed a baker to bake bread every morning so that the boys could get a slice of bread or whatever it was, but the bakery is there, restored exactly as it was in his day, even with the ovens. So the Faha Chapel, there's two corners of it left. That's all is left. Because after Cromwell, it was, uh, it was abandoned, and Mass was said there in secret. It was a thatched roof church, as was most of them at the time. And you mentioned... Um uh, Ignatius Rice's daughter? Her name was Mary, Ma Mary Rice, and his two stepsisters. His mother was married twice. His, his, his mother's first husband, his name was Murphy, and she had two daughters by him. And when he died, she married Rice's father, and she had seven sons by, by, by Rice, no daughters. So the two daughters were, were here in Waterford, and they lived in Arundel Lane. Uh, I think there's a plaque there on the house in the house where they lived. So Rice, when when the daughter was 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 uh, born, I should I should tell you that he lived in in, Bally, in Ballybricken at that time. After marriage, he lived in Ballybricken, approximately where London supermarket is now. That's roughly where he lived, and he moved down. Then after his wife's death, he moved down to his two sisters, stepsisters, sorry, in Arundel Lane, and they looked after his daughter. They brought his daughter up. Now, after he founded the order, he settled twelve pounds a year on his daughter. A lot of money at that time, and the order carried that on until her death. Now, here's the extraordinary thing about it: she outlived him by fifteen years. He died in eighteen forty-four, and she died in eighteen fifty-nine. Now, remember, she, I said she was epileptic and semi-paralyzed, so she must have got the best of care and attention to live that long. And she died in Carrick on Shore, 
in the presentation kind of the presentation ones took to go over the after the sisters married and I think they died the stepsisters the presentation ones to go over the the uh, responsibility of Edmund Race's daughter so she's buried in Glencomer uh, it's a small cemetery on the back road from Clonmel to from uh, Carrick to Clonmel it's on the back road there the grave is not marked uh, it was an old cemetery, and a lot of the tombstones have, have fallen over the years. The two David brothers are also buried there, founders of the GA. The two very famous men from Carrick, they're also buried there. And not very far away, there's the, uh, uh, the there's a monastic order there. Can't remember their names now. The, the Rosminians, they have a they have a church and a, and a monastery there, very close to the, where the cemetery is. You mentioned as well the Jewish people. Oh yes, there was a there was a large Jewish community in Waterford that happened in, in the thirties and forties. Now, unfortunately, and I say this in, in all honesty, they're gone. We have we have no Jews in Waterford, and it's very simple. Why? Wherever you, wherever you have Jews, you have wealth. There's no doubt about that because if they, they they seem to sense where wealth is and they follow it. Now, the reason that, that the Jews left Waterford was that there was no Jewish girls to marry. Simple as that. So they went to where the central population was, Cork and Dublin, where they would meet Jewish girls. There's one Jewish, there was one Jewish girl uh, here in Waterford. Uh, she's, she became a, a famous surgeon in, uh, in um, Manchester. Her name was Lath. There was only, another, only one other Jewish girl that I knew of, and her name was Wolfson. And she married uh, a Jew from, Bel from Belfast, where, where she went to live. They were the only Jewish girls in the city. There were a few others, all right, but they had they had married and moved away. So that was the whole. That was the reason we lost our Jewish population in Waterford. And how did they get here in the first place? Most of them came here to a, to escape persecution in Russia. Uh, their their fathers would have came here. Russia, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, those, those countries, which, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia were under the control of Russia. So Russia was very, very hard on Jews. And they made their way across Europe. And Ireland was a kind of a, a haven at the time. There was no persecution whatsoever. They settled in Cork, Limerick, Waterford and Dublin. They were the four major centres. Eventually some of them moved to Belfast, where they opened up various businesses. But they were an asset, and I'll tell you what they, I'll tell you what they were. They were, they were people who would teach you uh, how to live properly. Their Sabbath was very sacred to them. They closed down on a Friday evening, and did not open until Monday morning. Today you have instead of people going to the church, they go to the supermarket. That's the new temple, as far as I can see. I don't see any sense. I don't see any reason why the supermarket has to be open on Sunday. It doesn't make sense to me at all. This was a lovely city in the days when supermarkets and shops did not open on a Sunday. It was quite peaceful. You'd go to the country for a walk and you, you, you could go into the city and you weren't bombarded by traffic and noises from the supermarkets, which, which, you, have the, which you have every Sunday. Personally, I don't like it. It's not the Ireland I grew up in. <coughs> This is a separate thing altogether. How old is this house? Well, I'm, be, I'm going to guess now, and it, it will be a guess. Possibly 200, 200 years old. Because if you look, you go across the road and look, none of these follow a pattern. They're all, they're all, different, uh, they're all different bits and scraps. Do you know what I mean? Where, where I live in the Cork Road, every, every house is a, a terrace house, they're all the same pattern. Across the road there, they nearly all the same pattern. Well, you had separate landlords who built houses. They built to their own specifications, and then there was no planning at all. So it could go up anyway, but I think this is well, well in excess of 200 years old. Mm. I, couldn't, I couldn't put a date on it. And uh, any other memories of Barry Street? Like well, I have. Trading going on? Oh, yeah, there was a shop next to, next to Mount Syme, which was like Aladdin's Cave, Bridgie Welch's. It's part of the school now. <clears throat> that uh, that shop sold everything you could possibly imagine. The window was very large. Uh, what would it be? 
I'm not going to use metric now. It was about six feet tall, the window, be more, 12 feet, be near the mark, about 12 feet tall and about, about 18 feet wide. And everything was jumbled into that. You had conversation lozenges mi- 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 mixed up with sticky apples, and you had the you had bullseyes having a row with with the uh, cleaves as taffy. You had ties then thrown in, little engines, uh, balloons, you name it. It was there in the shop. And inside in the shop then, the shop was, was lit with gas. It was, a, it was an explosion waiting to happen. The most dangerous shop I was ever in in my life. Uh, only afterwards I found out it was dangerous. I, at the time I didn't, think it, I didn't think it was. But it was, it was gas lit, very, very dim light, and a huge barrel of paraffin oil up at one end. You smell the paraffin oil the minute you went in. So people bought paraffin oil for their lamps because the lot didn't have electricity. And... Uh, uh, Nine times out of ten, the, the taste of sweet was impregnated with paraffin oil, so you, you, had, a, you, you had a cocktail. Uh, that was an amazing shop. Now, the other, other side of Mount Sign, there was Matty Nolan's, which, which is now the, the, the rice, um, what is it, restaurant and guest, guest house. Matty Nolan was there. Matty had a vegetable shop, but it was also a refuge for rebels because fellas on the, on the, the duck from school, or the mooch, as we used to call it, Went into Matty and you and you were you, you were uh, custody, you were put under the counter. Matty had talked to them for the rest of the time. Brother, come and get in quick, and the brother come in. Matty, any see any lads around here? No, no, none of them came in this morning. Well, they came in, but by Dilliska, right? But Dilliska should add as a seaweed, an edible seaweed. Uh, they came in to buy Dilliskin, one or two bought apples. You have none of them here. No, none of them here at all. I wouldn't dream of keeping moochers. Brother, go off and we'd have it to resume the conversation with Matty. But you paid for the following day and you went in. When you eventually went back to school, you had to go back. Because the school attendance officer at the time was a, a man named Lacey. And he used to cycle around on, on a bicycle. He was an old Ari seaman. He'd cycle around on the bicycle and he had, he had a gimlet eye. He'd cop anybody. And he, if a young fellow that was around at that particular time, say any time after 12 o'clock in the day, between 12 and 4, it have to account for his movements. Where were you? What are you doing? You're not in school. You stuck out like a sore thumb. The only way you could escape is when there was a fair day in Ballybrick and you went down and worked with the farmers, driving cattle here and there, and hoped that you wouldn't be seen among the cattle. <laughs> Recollections of school days. What <coughs> games did you play? When you were young? Games. <coughs> when there was cowboys and Indians, of course, naturally. There was hurling, naturally. You... you uh, the hurl, you're practically born with a hurl in your hand, especially when you went to Mount Sain, because you went up to the sports field every um, Tuesday at a half day on Tuesday. And the half day was to go up and play hurling. And uh, we went fishing for pinkeens, uh, red gills, out skibbereen. That's now all built up now. There's a beautiful stream out there where you could fish for them. And we learned an awful lot about the countryside because... Uh, we lived close to the country. We, we we could foretell what the summer was going to be like in advance. There were two things you did. You went out in February and March, out to the top of Grace Dew to what, what we used to, what was known as uh, Cody's Pond. The pond is still there. They want to eliminate that. Some people objected to it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's preserved now, I know that. But we went to the pond and you'd watch where the frogs had laid the eggs. And if the eggs were in deep in the water, you're going to have a warm summer. If they're out near the bank, you're going to have a wet summer. Not necessarily cold, but a wet summer. Because the the eggs had to be had to have make sure that the tadpole had to make sure that it had plenty of water. And if it was if it was going to be a dry summer, they'd go out in the deepest part of the pool to lay the eggs. Second thing you looked for the last two trees to to uh, leaf is the oak and the ash. And there's an old Irish proverb that uh, tells you what to do. Uh, Ash before oak, soak. Oak before ash, dash. Now what that means is if if the ash leaves before the oak, you're going to have a very wet summer. But if the oak is last to to leaf, you only have an odd drop of rain here and there. And that works. That still works the present time. 
Now, there are not many yoke or ash trees. You have to go down to the park now to find them. But before, the countryside was full of them. Uh, games, we hadn't much time for games. We'd play football in Hurling under the lights in the night time. And the, I have a criminal record for, for, for playing under the lights. The guard caught me and I was fined a half crown. There'd be silent cycling guards. That was the only crime that was committed at the time. Silent cycling guards go around try to try to pounce on you. Uh, I lived in Nemi Street and they used to, they used to, we'd watch them and they'd go up up, uh, up Yellow Road, walk up up Yellow Road, get to the top of Griffith Place then, and there was a fall down. They'd cycle down like blazes then down, down Griffith Place to try and nab the perpetrators. Usually we were caught. Uh, other times we'd escape and go up the, the backs, go down Griffith Place and the Griffith Place house is the original house is there. There were uh, a back entrance to all of these. It was a, a right away. You go up that right away, it was pitch dark of course, and uh, go up there, one of us is st- stay behind behind a gooseberry bush or what have you. The guard would have to abandon his bike when he went so far so we your job then was to leave the window to this or the tires. And he'd speak a language that the clergy didn't know. The place would be blue when he'd find the wind gone out of his bike and he had no criminal cut. Wonderful. We used to enjoy that. That, that was that was terrific. That was a terrific game. And where was the barracks then? Barracks. The, the police guard barracks. Down here, where the where the army barracks was. That that, that was in uh, pre uh, the barracks. The barracks street end of it, not not the Newport, not the Green Street. I told you that was the secondary school. But during that time, the guards occupied the um, barracks just just inside. There was a sergeant's plan there lived in the house inside there and reared his whole family. Uh, they all went to, an unusual thing, they were the only guard sons ever went to Mount Sain. Guards didn't send their sons to Mount Sain. Neither did the RAC. They sent them to the understand. Work that one out. It's a fact. I never had, we never had an RAC man's son going to Mount Sain when I was there. Never did a guard son go there except the Splans. They were the only exception to the rule. Uh, but anyway, we, we got away from that. The, uh, so is that a split then in the, in the town? Oh yes, definitely. Oh definitely. Oh definitely. Oh, there's a, the, the, it's, it's not there anymore. But they used to kill each other for, for the love of God. And you go out in the hurling field and tell Lasalle was one of the hurling teams and Mount Sain was the other. But was it political? Then? Oh political, yes. Yes, very political. Uh, it determined the politics of your parents in Waterford when I was grown up determined what your politics were. Uh, sorry. So the, example, I, no, the school you went to determine the politics of your fear. So, for example, Fianna Fáil would be... No, uh, not Fianna Fáil, Republican. Let's, okay. let, let's not mix it up. Uh, they, they didn't put brands on like that at the time. It's, it's a brand name now, all right. Sinn Féin, we say that. Sinn Féin, yes. But now, I mean, you say from Sinn Féin that time, would Fianna Fáil would have come... Oh yes, Fianna Fáil came from Sinn Féin, but I, I, I don't want to put a label on it. Okay. You see, I want to divide it between Republican and, and Royalist, which is what you had in Waterford. Yeah. No, a Royalist, or um, pro-British, went to Del Sain. A Republican went to Mount Sain. It was as simple as that. There was historical reasons for it. As I told you earlier on, the Christian Brothers were a legal organisation, so they got nothing from the state. De La Salle were brought here by a bishop, a Dr. Power, who hated the Christian brothers. And he wanted their influence curbed, so he brought in the De La Salle brothers. And they were given a, a Protestant grammar school, free and gratis, as their first school by the British government. They were also paid. Now, when the school inspector was going around, remember he was a government appointee. When the school inspector was going around, statues were removed from the classroom in De La Salle prayer to independence the Christian brothers refused to remove the statues they left them there that was the difference one, one, was, one was middle of the road conservative not going to rock the boat the others were not we, this, is our, this is our belief this is what we do and we, we do our own thing we're under no obligation to you and you were brought up you were taught in that way you were taught complete independence and would there be any basis, we say, for, I mean, would there be any belief, therefore, that Rice himself was a kind of a... Rice was a, Rice was a, 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 a very gentle man. He, he was, but he was, he was a rebel in his own way, a quiet rebel. 
So it's difficult to understand. He was he was un, he was in pe- in penal times, when uh, a Catholic couldn't even inherit. One of the penal laws was terrible in so far as that, if you had, if you would say a family of four sons, one of them decided to become Protestant. He was the only one inherited that family, that farm. Now, he he could throw his brothers out, but you would you would remain his tenant as long as you lived. His father remained his tenant as long as the father lived. After that then, the property became his. Penal laws. They were, they were terrible, they were unbelievable. I wrote them all down when, uh, in an article there a few years ago. All the penal laws, as they were. Do you remember them? Oh yes, I remember a lot of them. Uh, let's see if I can, if I can um, start off. Um, a Catholic could not become become a, a solicitor, a, a surgeon. He could not hold any government office. In other words, he he was a, he was a non-being. He didn't exist. Uh, if a Catholic married a Protestant, uh, she 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 lost all her inheritance rights, or he lost his inheritance rights, whichever whichever sex it was. They lost all rights to inheritance. Uh, I told you the other one: if, if one of them became, if they, one of the family became a Protestant, all the inheritance should go to him, nobody else. Um, what other ones were there? I forget them now, but I, I have them, they're, they're written down. Mm. I, 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 for, I actually forget all of them. Mm. Uh, you couldn't endow a school. Uh, there was a very good reason for that. A uh, school for boys couldn't be opened, but you could open a school for girls. Now the thinking behind that was, if the men are uneducated, the women will have nothing to try to do with them, so the race will be wiped out. It's very subtle. I mean, it's, it's impossible to imagine. The cunning of the English is unbelievable. That's how they, that's how they, they ran their empire. Absolutely cunning. There is no other word to describe them. Ruthlessly cunning. And of course, I told you about the spire. The Catholic Church couldn't have a spire. Neither could a Presbyterian or Methodist. You mentioned earlier on too about, um, or maybe it was last year I was talking to you about Thomas Francis Marr's brother. Yes, Thomas Francis Marr didn't come from a Republican family. Thomas Francis Marr came from an extreme ultra conservative family. His father, Thomas Francis Marr's father, was an MP for the city. He spent, I think it was nine years in the um, British House of Parliament, nine very unimpressive years. All he was interested in was trade and the accumulation of wealth. Now, Thomas Francis Marr, his father sent him to, to uh, Clongoeswood College. He spent up to the age of nine in Mount Sain. This is very significant. Up to the age of nine, Thomas Francis Marr went to Mount Sain. Then his father, conservative father, sent him to Clongo's Wood. Now there are no one more conservative than Jesuits. Jesuits are middle of the road men all the time. They won't rock the boat. So he went to Clongo's Wood where he was made into a little, a nice little Englishman. And to finish his education, then he was sent to Stonyhurst College, the top uh, Jesuit college in Europe, where he, where he acquired, believe it or believe it not, an upper crust English accent. Thomas Francis Mayer had that for many, many years. The net result was the people of Waterford didn't trust him too much because of his upper crust accent. Now his brother, his brother became the commander in chief of the barracks up here, the artillery barracks at the top of Barrack Street, while Thomas Francis Mayer led the Young Ireland movement. Now how that came about is, is very significant. Mayer was in Dublin. He was working in Dublin. He was, he was, he was, a, he was a, a lawyer by profession. And I have to say that I agree with what Padraig Pierce said about the law. It is an immoral profession. And Pierce is a barrister. Gave it up after three cases. But anyway, uh, Mayor was, Ma was a solicitor. And he practiced in Dublin. And he came under the influence of um, Thomas Davis, who was a committed Republican. A man I admire immensely, Thomas Davis. Protestant from Mallow, uh, leader of the Young Ireland Movement. Died at a very young age from TB. But... Um, Mayor came under his influence and he turned completely a Republican. So much so that he opposed his father in an election here in Waterford. His father defeated him, of course. But um, it'll show you that 
something came out in Mare that was back in the distant past. His grandfather was a rebel in the 90th Rebellion in South Tipperary. And he went on the run. And he went off to Newfoundland, where he made a fortune in trade. He married a widow over there, and she had money, and they made a, they made a fortune. He sent his son then, the, fa the father of Thomas Francis Mayor, here to Waterford to look after that end of the business. So the son was a native of Newfoundland, not Waterford. And he came here and uh, set up the trade here between here and Newfoundland. And his son, Thomas Francis Mayor, then became the leader of the Young Ireland Movement. Was sentenced to death by uh, the courts in Clonmel. It was commuted to life to transportation for life to Van Diemen's Land, now Tasmania. He escaped in he married in Tasmania. He married a girl named Catherine Bennett. And she no she I'm sorry, I I'm I'm evading your house. Uh, she, she she Catherine Bennett was was, was the daughter of an Aborigine and this this rebel, Bennett from Wexford, who was transported to Van Diemen's land. So they married and they had one they had one son who was buried in Hobart in Tasmania. He died out there. Now in the meantime, Thomas Francis Mayer escaped with the with the uh, aid of his in laws <coughs> and he set sail. Yeah, he had no equipment. He set sail from the from the uh, Tasmania, picked up by an American whaler who hated the British. And the whaler captain took him on board. He spent some time around the the uh, Antarctic after Wales, finally arrived back in New York, where he was greeted as a hero by the people of New York. He went on a, on a lecture tour then uh, of the whole states uh, about Irish Republicanism, and the Civil War started. And he recruited, he recruited a battalion to fight in the Civil War against the Southern States of America. Now, ironically, the man who was transported to Van Diemen's land with him, John Mitchell, took the Confederate side. And John Mitchell had two sons killed in the Confederate Army. Now, that's a rather, a rather strange contradiction. Mitchell, a Republican, was a, was a racist. And that's, a, that's rather rare. Mitchell had no time for the, the Negro. He thought that they were inferior. Mayor thought the other way. Mayor thought they were entitled to the freedom. So anyway, the Civil War ended and Mayor was an outer work general. And he had married now the second time. And his second wife was, um, what was the name on the tip of my tongue now, that terrible. Uh, she came from an old Yankee family who were very, very aristocratic. They didn't want her to marry this, this mad Irishman at all. Elizabeth Townsend, that was her name. She only died in 1900. Recent as that. So uh, they went, he was given a job, possibly through the influence of his in-laws, he was given a job as acting governor of Montana. And he went to Montana, which was a, a territory at the time, it wasn't a state. And there he found that there was an awful lot of division between the southern and northern people. And uh, he found the Indians being persecuted. He took their sides. He did a lot of things that... Uh, Shouldn't have, he shouldn't have done if he was in politics. He was too honest. So he released one fellow that was accused of murder and that appealed his case, and Mayor Preston took up the case and found out your man wasn't guilty. And they say he was accidentally drowned. I never accepted that. So a few years ago I was in America and I did some research while I was there, and I found out that Mayor was murdered. And I've done an article on that. He was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan or as they were known as then, the Vigilantes. Because when he was governor of Montana, or acting governor, he fell foul of both the Republicans and the Democrats. He regarded the Republicans as being very, very wrong, the way they were treating the defeated Democrats of the South. And he regarded the Democrats as being no different to the British in their treatment of the Negro. So he had no friends. And if you were not a member of a party in America and registered as such, and tore their line, they got rid of you. So $4,000 was paid for the elimination of mayor. And a fellow was tried as late as 1907 for the murder of Thomas Francis Mayor, a fellow named, named Miller. And he disappeared in the jail. No one knew what happened to him.
It's a long story about Mayor. I'm not going to go into it now. He's no relation to you, uh, this Miller. Thank God he's not. <coughs> right, are you all right? Mm-hmm. What, the fly is <laughs> There's a fly buzzing around. Um, right, could we, before we before drop you back, Jack? Yeah. Uh, the, the crest here, strange enough, over Christian Brothers Monastery is the De La Salle crest. And at the time the monastery was being built, the brother superior here at the time insisted that the Christian Brothers were actually an offshoot of the De La Salle Brothers, which is absolutely incorrect. So he insisted on the De La Salle crest being put on over the door. Now it's the only monastery, the only Christian Brothers Monastery that has a De La Salle crest. Was he uh, was a bit mad or anything? Or what, what, where did he get this idea? It's a debatable point whether he was mad or not. I, uh, I, I, I believe he was because to, to, to even, even think the way he thought is, is ridiculous. What year was this? Don't hold me to a year, but I think there's a, I'm not, I don't know the short answer now, but I, you, you can find out very easily. Uh, the monastery was designed by Peter. The, the famous architect and uh, Pugin also designed the presentation convent. They're the only two places in water that were designed by Pugin. They're magnificent, both magnificent buildings. This is a massive light inside. It's a really gorgeous building. Now, there's not any, anything more I can tell you about it. Okay, we'll over to the, uh, over the bakery. Uh, He had a tailor and a baker employed fully during, during, his, during his period of office. And the tailor made suits for the boys making their first Holy Communion and Confirmation. That should be in reverse because you were confirmed first then before you made your Holy Communion, which I think was more intelligent. And the boys coming into school in the morning who didn't have a breakfast, each of them were given a loaf of bread and a cup of milk every morning without fail because rice his idea was uh, an empty stomach made an empty brain. And if your stomach was empty, you concentrated too much on the stomach, consequently you couldn't learn. And it made sense. So he supplied them all with, with uh, bread and milk. Uh, a practicing, a practical as well as a practicing Christian, a rather rare thing to find. That was Edmund Rice. The entrance is here. Right. There's, a, there's, a, there's two doorways here. One, one leads into the one door leads into the bakery. The other leads in, into the into the tailor shop. I think this is. I'm not too sure, but I think this is the tailor shop. Yeah. 
That's, that was the chair of shop. That's the bakery. Hello. Nice to meet you. Restored. Oh, it restored exactly as it was. Even the oven was restored. They're gone out of here. They're, they're gone up to. They're gone up to. Uh, they're gone up to Newtown to live. And you have brothers here now from Pakistan, Newfoundland, America, Canada, uh, South Africa. They're all living here now. But what they're going to do, I don't know. Their, their brothers are coming from the continent and uh, different different parts of the other continents. The, the chapel is going to be moved over to where I'll show you where it is going to be moved. That's almost gone now. So give us all the words now again. Bun Skull Canuck Sheen. And Mount Saint Intermediate School. And that was the entrance. That was the entrance. That's that's where you went to school, and these 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 uh, these houses inside there, and that one, were the were, were the were the school rooms. That is what you might call poverty that it existed then. As well as their pupils, you got you got a, a second education there for three pounds a year. That's all they charged, and I often think. Uh, my way of went to secondary education was forty pounds a year, as opposed to three. Quite a quite a quite a change, wasn't it? Quite a difference. <laughs> but that's all I can tell you about. Can you that. see any of that, Ken? This is the oldest pub and undertaking business in Park Street in Waterford, actually. It's a debate point on the pub is the oldest, but the undertaking business certainly is. 1773 it was established. And the pub dates in the same period. Now others claim that their their pubs are older. I don't think so. To me, this is the oldest pub. And this undertaken establishment, they had the removal of Edmund Rice in 1844. That is the removal of his remains from the grave in 
1942 to the cathedral and back to the mausoleum that was then erected in the gardens of Mount Sinai. And to his final resting place in 1979, they moved his remains again. So that must that must constitute a record. The fact that uh, the same undertaking business could move his remains three times. I don't believe any other other unfortunate man has moved as often as that. How would you know any of the, the previous generation people? Well, I know John Thompson, the present owner. He'd be uh, early 60s, I would think. I remember his father very well. His father was an undertaker also. It's, it's in the family from the uh, 18th century, which is quite a record. That, that, uh, that's, that closed off that closed off the area. It was once a laneway <coughs> known as Harrington's Lane. And they have their uh, uh, funeral parlour in there now, as far as I'm aware. Oh, what, would there be houses down there? Originally? Oh, there was, yes. There was quite a number of houses. There were six houses down there, to, to, as far as I can recollect. And can you remember any other lane ways Oh, yes there, was, yes, there was quite a number of them. The uh, Convent Hill there, it's up, which is the... Uh, that was known as Nunnery Lane in the olden days because the presentation convent was down the, the base of it. Uh, there was a lane uh, off Short Course there, which was called Peter's Lane. It was it, it ran it bisected the entrance there, and that was an RAC barracks there at the corner, with the present bookie shop. That was an RAC barracks, with the entrance to it from Peter's Lane. Uh, down further, then you had uh, Neef's Lane, which I mentioned earlier on, where, where there was a, a, a Jewish resident, and a little bit further down, then you had Well Lane. Uh, that's. That's all I can remember. There was a few others, but I can't remember their names. An awful lot of our people lived in lanes, substandard housing, all that kind of thing. It was very common. Uh, bad government. We were the we were the coolies of Western Europe. The only thing the English were sorry for is that we weren't black. They could have justified a lot of the things they did. They built three things very well, though, in fairness to them. They built poor houses, mental hospitals, and jails, because we were going to end up in one of the three. 